Chapter 12. The Robe The holy man had learned the language of the country. After purchasing supplies, he kept a doctor's appointment, then went to the park and played with the children. He sorely missed children up at the hermitage. They ran to him, greeting him happily. He played ball with them, wrestled, and rolled down the grassy hill. They played hide-and-seek among the many tentacled banyan trees, then enjoyed a long, silent period in which they sat together, listening to each other breathe, a scene the mothers, fathers, and nannies found awesome and inexplicable. Then he stared up the mountain, sticking with his decision to take the back path so that the pilgrims would not be upset by the sight of some Butinsky forging ahead, one who did not wear the distinguishing robe. It was a beautiful day. He felt happy, free, so glad to be out and about. Now that he was older, or, face it, old, his friends at the hermitage were growing terribly protective of him and weren't inclined to let him do his share of the supply getting. They didn't like him going off alone, were afraid that something might happen to him, that he might have a fall, or, who knows, a heart attack. He smiled. Come to think of it, they were right. Something had happened to him. He had been knocked unconscious and stripped of his robe. Now his friends would be impossible in their concern, and yet they knew as well as he himself that one couldn't live with fear or one wasn't living at all, and worry was beneath contempt. What a waste of reason. It was up to him, not them, to look out for himself, not to fall, to step carefully, pick up his feet, be attentive. What happened this morning was his fault because he hadn't given up the robe. He walked through the woods of clattering leaves, as he called it, which was mostly ginkgo trees. Joe had taught himself the names of flora and fauna, but now he liked to make up names of his own. Here, because of the cascade and waterfall, there was also a breeze stirring the leaves of the deciduous trees, hence the clattering sound. Why hadn't he relinquished the robe, he asked himself. He was surprised at his stubborn behavior. Why had he not raised his arms and allowed it to be whipped away, or, better still, simply taken it off himself and given it to the man who wanted it so terribly bad? What was his attachment to his robe? He was not ashamed of his old body. Certainly it was not as pretty as it once was. The skin was dry and slack and hung in folds. His limbs had shrunk. Even his member was diminished. His legs were bowed as if he'd been a perpetual cowboy. But he didn't care. His body wasn't him, and he had no more control over its aging than he did of his breath, come when it may. One simply let go of things beyond one's control, didn't trouble about them, didn't let them bow them bow one down he did miss the unconfined feeling of the robe the air on his legs he'd forgotten the discomfort of pants now he had reached the pasture of stumpy legged dappled ponies and so he climbed on the fence to watch them being put through their paces waving to their fence sitting equine observers on the other side there was a game in progress similar to polo. The difference was the riders rode bareback and reinless, the horses responding to signals from their knees and heels. Uniquely, the field of play was steep, not flat, and the only goal was at the upward end. There was no downward end. The ball, if it eluded the sweeping mallets, could roll downhill for miles. Joe was a keen fan of the game, too keen, and only allowed himself a few minutes, well, ten, before forcing himself off the fence and back on the trail. He walked briskly on to where the path diverged, hermitage trail and back trail, taking the back one. After five more miles, he stopped, set down his pack, and looked about. He viewed the valley below, the hills beyond outlined in layers against the horizon. Cirrus and cumulus pattern patterned the sky like giant Japanese characters, cloud haiku. Around him were wild grasses, flowers, scattered rocks. Insects were everywhere, and a mockingbird, blown from its normal flight pattern, virtually lost on an unknown mountain, perched itself on the limb of an altitude-stunted tree and sang joyously, not knowing the meaning of anxiety. There were masses of blue flowers resembling pieces of fallen sky, releasing only a faint scent as if their main thrust was color. He leaned down to one of the ubiquitous springs and drank deeply. Then he plucked a yellow apple from his pack and thanked nature and the hands of men and women for providing it before biting into it. It was a good apple. He lay back and joined the warm sun on his skin. He was glad that the many people who came to see him were experiencing this too. Most of them probably never had climbed a mountain or slept under the stars. He wished everyone in the world could have such a celestial vacation, get back in touch with earth and sky. 
He watched a raven and a red-tailed hawk soar in tandem, performing sensational aerial stunts as if to challenge the other's winged skill. Joe was, uh, was unable to judge the winner, never having flown himself. He lost the flight masters in the sun, closed his eyes, and reflected some more on the question of the begrudged robe, his not relinquishing it. But it no longer interested him. What was done was done, and good had come of it. If the famous man hadn't struck him down, the point man wouldn't have come to his understanding of how to be. And probably right about now, the famous man, wending his way downhill in his jockey shorts, was coming to an understanding too.